the other ones, I'll give you hints tomorrow near the end of the period. Well, I'll, I'll better do yours a little bit earlier because I kind of going to have your first period. But it depends where I quit. Because I want to do at least one or two questions about uh, should I do a reconstruction, should I do about the war. But you got, your guys' test will be Wednesday. And then we'll be going. Yeah. So it's not going to be a huge for this. No. Huh? No, you're going to be here. Yes. Tuesday is A day, yeah. Wednesday's B day, Thursday's online, right? Yeah, but I'm going to have all the online. If you're, uh, okay. What's everybody, uh, Monday, everybody who's online on, so this is your online day for uh, digital, you have to check in either. Uh, actually, everybody third period online, just check in either Tuesday or Wednesday and take the test on that day. So we'll get it done. Everybody will be done on that day. Sound good? And then we'll do online. So I'm going to treat next Thursday like I, I do. To me, that'll be like, uh, like yesterday. Just a good day. And I think a lot of people are doing that. And if they're not, I'm going to act like a lot. Okay, so with that, so that'll be a test, just a unit test. It'll be no more than a mile long. So you should be done relatively fast. And bring sneakers. Bring good shoes. Okay. No offense, but I need better than that. You're going to get blisters. You're going to get blisters. Uh, there'll be some multiple choice and short IDs. Sound good? 25 to 30 short IDs. That sounds fair to me, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm thinking five. Five, I think that's, that's about, that's a, like a, be the equivalent of an essay. Sure. Uh, without, so it, it's good. All right, next, uh, something else. Oh, so we're going to finish the war today and and hopefully start to look some of the elements of reconstruction. And uh, the last little messages, yesterday I told you about the the horrific fighting in 1864 from Spot, the wilderness, Spotsylvania, Petersburg. Who got, what, what, who commanded the army that got to the very gates of Atlanta, but they're stalemate? The U.S. Yes. Yeah, that's Sherman. William Tecumseh Sherman. And he's meet at Grant Petersburg. Uh, what else? Oh, who's the Democratic nominee, which is right here for president? McClellan. McClellan. And Lincoln, like the hat. <laughs> he was not alone in wearing that hat, but since you know, that still five hats, those still still five hats were really popular. But since he was, he's already 6'4". And you wear the hat, it's just really startling, and in the pictures of them, yeah. What do you think about the historic event that happened yesterday? The historic event? The well, we're going to talk about tomorrow, if everything goes right, we'll talk about the first impeachment. Johnson. And that's going to be President Johnson. And, yeah, this is a, this is a, what I think is, 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 is what I think. But, historically, this is, that was a really big deal yesterday. Not only the fact that the president has been impeached twice, but never before have so many members of his own party voted to impeach him. It's almost always been members of the opposite party, and out of uh, for various reasons, you know, they no matter how guilty the the person is or, or not guilty, of course, there hasn't been that many impeachments of presidents. Or two by one person now. But first president to have more impeachments than terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to look at it too. But uh, unless he uh, is not found guilty, they don't find him as leading an insurrection under the 14th Amendment. And he, I guess he could run again, but he would be quite old. I think that would be kind of hard for him. But um, this is a big deal about uh, more people. And I should add that even if well, Senator McConnell was a Republican who, who now says he's kind of for impeachment. We never, never can tell with him what he really thinks. He says he's kind of for it, but he says there'll be the Senate will not uh, reconvene until the 19th, and Biden will be inaugurated on the 20th. But they can still impeach him after, and that's actually ha or uh, not impeach, convict, goes to the Senate for conviction. He's already impeached. And the uh, cabinet level officials are also impeached. And in 1876, General Grants, well, President Grants, 
Secretary of War was impeached for taking bribes about that. And uh, he uh, he was impeached. Well, actually, he resigned when he realized, oh, my God, I'm really going to be impeached. He resigned, but it still went to the Senate for trial. Um, some Southern Democrats just wanted to slap. We um, were angry about this, and so they didn't uh, vote for it. Vote for him guilty, and, and it requires two thirds of vote. Yes. Kind of ironic. A president impeached for taking bribes, and then a president who says given bribes. Yeah, that's actually true. Uh, Nixon would have been impeached for both, <laughs> but he, he resigned before it happened. Uh, Johnson just blatantly disobeyed the law. Um, Clinton had an affair, and that was. Political. President Trump, uh, this is uh, this has not happened before, and the president and it just literally it just literally came out today that uh, intelligence agents were warning that the president's lies would trigger uh, a potential with violence, terrorist acts, and perhaps insurrection, and they said this days ago, well before the actual event. That's the U.S. You know that's. Um, with FBI and National Security Agency. Literally just came out today. And there was, uh, there was reports of like on messaging apps, people, like thousands of people talking about before the event. Oh. Yeah, the FBI claimed they warned it. This, this sounds like, a, and I, I think it was also just, they never thought. There, there are some elements of, yeah, a little bit of racism. There. Okay, so. Let's get back to this now. We got Lincoln, and everybody thought Lincoln was going to, to uh, lose. And I told you yesterday, he wrote that letter to McClellan basically saying it's over. I mean, this is the end of the country. Now, don't get me wrong. There might have been something called the United States Survive after some kind of peace conference, but it would have been nothing like you think of the United States. And it would have broken apart. Because once you have one country leave, then anybody just will leave. You know, see us suckers, we don't like this law. Yeah, Texas would have been gone long ago. And they still talk about it to this day. But trust me, in the next four years, you're going to hear a lot of talk about Texas seceding. And I think I showed you this pictures, and yes, doesn't he look like a toad? Very toad-like. And so this actually cartoon we got from you, the stalemate at Petersburg and um, at Atlanta. It seemed like a call of a win. And this picture is really obnoxious, implying that Lincoln was trying to, you know, Lincoln was equal. This is like, a, like both sides were bad here, Lincoln and Davis. He's the traitor. There's no, there's no equivalence. Lincoln's flawed, like everybody outside of this room is flawed. We're not flawed in here, right? We have no, I mean, ugh. that's why I go out there and be very careful about that. But he's a traitor. But anyways, who will save the country? Who? But who will actually? Who will actually do it? Grant. No. Sure. Johnson. Maria Teresa Austin. Who? Johnson. Calhoun. <laughs> uh, you know. He's dead. Calhoun is dead. Oh, what luck would have it? We have a picture of Raul. He's made up. How did you get to that position? Mind power. I'm like, thinking it happens. I try to use the power for good. If he's made up, then why does he look so real? I know. <laughs> I just saw the guy who made this picture. He, he's a great artist. He, he's an incredible artist. He might come talk to my uh, Western he's Civil. Like he, 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 he likes <laughs> Blondie and Paler. Another story. <laughs> Jefferson Davis. The president of the Confederacy will save the Union. How, pray tell. He hated Joseph E. Johnston, the commander of the Confederate forces in front of Atlanta. And he fired Johnston. As Johnston had done an amazing job. Remember, all they have to do is hold out until the election. And they, and they start voting in the middle of October. So hold out until the election. Instead, he replaced him with one of the most aggressive generals of the entire war. Johnston out, John Bell Hood. 
Hood, hard fighter from Texas. And he was in Lee's army. They sent him to the West to cause reinforcements. Lee actually warned Davis, and he's not a good commander. He will, he, he's too rash as an overall commander. He lost a leg and an arm during the fighting. Well, use of an arm. Uh, that explains the expression, I would argue. All he knew how to do was attack. I wonder if I'm recording this. Am I recording this? Yes, we're recording. OK. So what did he do? He counterattacked Sherman's larger army. Sherman's army was here. Hood is here. And in three battles, Hood counterattacked Sherman's army and destroyed his army. He beat his army against a superior force, superior men, and destroyed, and he had to evacuate Atlanta. And in just a few weeks, Atlanta fell, Sherman rolls in, they start voting in a month and a half, it's over. The tide was turned overnight. It's like somebody flipped a switch. Once Atlanta fell to the Union, it looks like we can win the war. That's what Northern was like. Everyone got that? I didn't write that down, but you make sure you got that. When Atlanta fell, we can win. All of a sudden, Lincoln goes from somebody who's very unpopular, who's leading this war that's never going to end. You know, people in the North are thinking, they just, they won. Just let the South go. Two, we're going to unify this country. It's over. We're going to win. Overnight. And then, at the same time, approximately, at least getting back to the North at the same time, a U.S. Navy, a fleet, took Mobile Harbor in, in Alabama. They had been trying for almost a year to take Mobile. The commander was David Farragut. You might remember Farragut. He's the admiral who took New Orleans. Farragut. In fact, this is a great picture of Farragut. His flagship, the Hartford, had a fight with uh, one of those ironclads the Confederates built. They didn't have enough to build a lot. They didn't have any. They just basically put a little boiler plate and slapped it on here. They called it Tennessee. You can barely see it right here. Let me shut the lights off. But you see the Confederate battle flag. And the Union ship, the Hartford, that was, they called it the Sloop. They, um, that was Farragut's flagship. And they fought the Tennessee literally hall to hall. They're firing their cannon at each other. It was that close. Farragut suffered from vertigo and didn't want to collapse as the ship rocked. Because it would look bad if the animal collapsed. He thought people might lose faith. This is just, yeah, this is a problem. So they tied him to the rigging. <laughs> they tied, he had, he ordered them to tie me there so he doesn't fall. So he's hanging over this as they're blasting away with 20 pound cannon, just a few feet away. 20 pound meaning they fired a 20 pound cannonball. Okay, that's what we call arguably crazy, but courage. <laughs> and Farragut, one of the uh, one of the squares in Washington, D.C. Uh, will be named after him, Farragut Square. If we go to D.C., it's like known for really good restaurants and things like that now, but it's after him. And yeah, he was a Virginia man, supposedly, but actually he was a Union man. And there are a number, this because it's a fourth, a very dramatic painting of the battle. The Confederates had these underwater mines. Now, when I mean mines, uh, they call them torpedoes then. And they would explode them with an electrical charge. So they make a kind of a static electricity battery and shoot a charge down. So they had that, just it's not a consistent power source. And it'd be under the water, and they try to explode it when it ships over the top. It explodes. And that's what torpedo meant. It meant exploding under the water line. So torpedo is a little different now, but it's still that same concept. And that happened. They started exploding these torpedoes and actually destroyed one ship. And a few of the captains of Union ships began to kind of veer off and slow down, worried about their ship being destroyed. And that's when Farragut gave his famous order, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. <laughs> And they went right over them. Mobile fell. We can win. It's such a big deal. It's one of those times where on the battlefield, like at Antietam, a few things different could have changed their entire course of history. 
The seven days, a few things differ. Gettysburg, a few things differ. Here, Lincoln won because Mobile and Atlanta, the Union will be preserved. So that meant that Northerners, the majority of them decided, and they voted overwhelmingly Republican members of Congress, we're going to finish this war. Now, McClellan, you know, gives you the idea, you know, this, the Republican Party had the majority of the North, but he still got 1.8 million votes, still 2.2 million. By the way, the Army voted overwhelmingly for Lincoln, even though they still remembered McClellan. He had this aura of building the Army. They voted for Lincoln. And how did they do it? By mail. As they did from time to more. They did World War II, World War I, every other war. And it was amazing in 2020, one of the reasons they said that, um, which was a blatant lie, but said that this election could have been fixed was it voted by mail. It was a fraud. So that means every election was a fraud and Lincoln should have been uh, uh, elected. <laughs> That's what we call not knowing history or counting on other people not knowing history. So they believe lies. But anyways, I love this picture from Harper's Magazine. <laughs> they drew really tall now that it had this picture. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. And I'm not stretched as well. They actually drew, I didn't like make it <laughs> taller for that picture. So when that happened, Hood, now desperate, because the South is gonna quit. They're not gonna quit. He decides to invade into Tennessee. Why did I put Tennessees? I have no idea how I did that. It's just supposed to be Tennessee. He invades into Tennessee. He thinks he can cut off Sherman's line. And all we need to know about this is he got up to Nashville and his army was destroyed. Destroyed. I mean, literally destroyed. I don't mean just beat where he couldn't hold Atlanta. I mean, gone. This would be the end of the Confederate Army of the West. General Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga, commanded the Union forces there, and they didn't just beat them back. They did, they had a few stragglers made it to North Carolina, but Hood really did end the Army of the West. So Nashville was one bloody, horrible battle. Really bloody. Something like 60% of the Confederate forces were casualties. That's unheard of casualty numbers. So here's Sherman. Where's Sherman? There's Sherman. Ah, Sherman's sitting here and he comes up with an idea. What if he abandoned his supply line? Because that would be require men to control it. He does, he's worried about Confederate cavalry. And he begins what's going to be called the march to the sea. And he proposes this to Grant, who agrees. They will live off the land, but they will cut a swath 60 miles wide, 60 to 80 miles. He has about 50 to 60,000 men. Cut a swath to the sea, destroying everything that could be used by the Confederate military. Everything that could be used. By the way, what can be used by the Confederate military? Everything. Everything. So destroy everything of value from Atlanta to Savannah, march to the sea. Basically telling the Confederacy, the longer you stay in the fight, we will destroy you. AKA Sherman is coming. In fact, he proposed that we must show the South that war is all hell. And if you might've heard war is hell, they shorten this about. And he literally said, we're going to make the South scream. And they'll have to quit fighting. Now, he didn't call it this yet. Now, Sherman is looking at this a very logical mind. I'm not saying you're know, logical doesn't mean you're a good person or a moral person or a bad person. But logically, I need to come up with a way to win this war. End this war now. It's over. We know we're going to win. we got to end it now. And so what he came up with in 1918, a German general by the name of Erich Ludendorff would call total war. And there is Sherman at, he's inspecting the Confederate defenses in Atlanta. 
total war. And total war is, was and is, the most horrible thing ever created by mankind. Because total war then will become a justification for some of the most heinous acts, not some of the most, the most heinous acts in history will be justified by total war. And you can see there are elements of people doing total war before, so it's not like they invented these tactics. But this became a state strategy, not only to win a war, but to control their own population. If you've ever heard of a term called totalitarianism, it, come, it, it comes out of the term total war, a state of constant war. Now, trust me, Sherman was not sitting there going, how do I destroy the world? No, he was, I'm going to end the war. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Oh, behind? Mm -hmm. I put this on my reconstruction stuff. So we just started reconstruction and put the end of the Civil War on there. And so that is a... Uh, this is from uh, Harper's Magazine, and it's right after the 15th Amendment was ratified, so it is a freedman, a former slave voting. And I'll show you the actual picture when we get there. So here's the first thing about it that everybody needs to understand. War is politics, and yet this is a political decision to stay in the war or end the war. So we're making a political decision. If anybody says, that war is military, keep the politicians out of it. Either they're dumb, and I'm just telling you right now, they're, they don't know what they're talking about, or they're lying and trying to mislead you. They're trying to manipulate you. Never trust anyone who says that. It does not mean they're a bad person, but watch your wallet. Where's the mouse? Mouse! That's a pretty good picture. So here's the thing. If you can't win an outright victory on the battlefield, and they're going to find out, you can't win an outright victory on the battlefield. That doesn't happen. They couldn't win an outright victory on the battlefield around Petersburg. In fact, what was it called? Where you're not going to win on the battlefield per se. You're just going to kill so many of the enemy, they have to quit. That's, What's attrition. That's attrition. So you can't just win that big, like, glorious victory of tactical maneuvers. That doesn't happen. And you think, well, wait a minute, didn't it kind of happen in other wars? No, what happened was they lost the battle and they sat, made a political decision. Okay, it's not worth it, we'll sue for peace. Wars aren't won on the battlefield. It doesn't mean that people will be killed and maimed on it. These are political decisions, which in a way makes it more horrible. Because the people making the decisions, they're not the ones dying. So what he said was this, let's target their industry. Let's target their transportation. If they, they don't have much industry. So if you knock out what little they have to produce and knock out their transportation, they won't go to fight. Gee, I wonder if total war would be a big short ID. Hmm. Let, me, let me do the look, let me do the. Absolutely. If you don't know short, if you don't know total war, you will be in trouble. <laughs> But now, can they really target industry and transportation? It's 1864. They can target some, right? Like a 60 mile swath. But they can target other things. They can target civilians. Turn everybody into a combatant. A combatant means somebody who's in the war, a fighter, a soldier. Target everybody. Why? Civilians at home and the ones farming. They're working the factories. They're the ones running the train system. You kill them, you make them suffer, and they can no longer fight. Civilians would become, I'm using air quotes here, legitimate targets. Legitimate. By the way, once you make the rational leap that we can't win the war on the battlefield, so let's target civilians so they just suffer so much they quit. And civilians are targets of war. What does that allow you to do? What's that? So say it again. It's a genocide. Genocide is a measure of total war. Exactly right. I said it. 
World War One, the first genocide would have to bring to a war in the Ottoman Empire. Why do you think Hitler would order the final solution in 1942? Because there's a total war and there is any economy. We have an enemy within. Total war is the most horrible thing you can imagine. But it also said, I can kill their civilians. I can kill their men, women, and children. I can maim them. I can murder them. That's a measure of war. And then you can just like, hey, we got to win the war. Why do you want us to lose? Then you break their will. You make them suffer and they cry. How do you do it? It's politics, right? You break their will, what do they want? A new government. They'll force their politicians to quit. Maybe even get a revolution. Have you heard of the Russian Revolution? Maybe you get a revolution in a war. And don't forget, the enemy is doing it to you. Don't forget. And it's like attrition on the grand scale. You wear the entire country down and you break them. Break them. That is total war. That is how wars are fought. When the United States in when were you born, most of you? 2004. 2003, 2004. So the war that was going on in your lifetime in Iraq, what was the first targets? Oil. No, we didn't want to destroy the oil. We wanted the oil. Yeah, but. I'm sorry, it was the war for freedom, but <laughs> I, I was I was totally opposed to it, so I'm, it's hard for me not to be cynical about it. What was our first target to bomb? Water, electricity, sewage facilities, roads, schools, hospitals. Why? To make civilians suffer. Then we would say, we didn't mean to kill anybody. If they just happened to be there, we bombed them. But that's what the United States did. And that's how they fight wars. That's how they, we fight wars now. And think about the technology. Yeah. So those not for those? Yeah. Yeah. In the past 20 years, you did that? 2003, 2004, 2005. Yeah. Well, we have a thing that will work on. We probably don't. Well, the thing about it is, is that targeting civilians. We would say, if our enemies do it, it's a war crime. The victors decide war crimes. You can, you can ignore the team if you want to hold the team on the team. Yeah, it's true. Like but think things. about by World War II. You have the technology to bomb them from the air. And if you kill civilians, they can't work in the factory because the factories can't run Canada. And when bombing from the air was not very accurate, didn't work. It started in, in Germany, but then in March of 45, it turned to Japan. Incendiary fire bombs. March of 1945, in one night, U.S. bombers killed 120,000 Japanese civilians. Wasn't that earlier in March 1945? Huh? What's that? March is not a good one. Oh. They destroyed half of Japanese cities and killed millions of people well before they dropped the atomic bombs. The atomic bombs were well over. It was gone. That was gone. They were trying to surrender. Yeah, wars get more horrible. Remember, I mentioned that before too. Wars get more horrible. Total war is a scary thing. Do not blame Sherman for it. But that's what it's going to become. And if we haven't even got, haven't even gotten, and we will, to what total war does to your own country. That's the thing. That's the biggie, too. So with that, the march to the sea. That is Atlanta. Atlanta was partially burnt when the Confederates retreated, so they finished the job. So they couldn't use Atlanta anymore. The Confederates could not use that as a supply hub. And then they destroyed uh, every, any building anybody resisted, because they also lived off the land, so they tried to hide their food. They resisted. They, Destroyed all food stocks so the Confederates couldn't get it. They destroyed so many homes and buildings along the way that the chimneys would only be, would be the only thing standing. Soon they were called Sherman's tombstones. And then uh, to railroads to make sure the Confederates couldn't use it. You rip off the rails, they just use them again. So he came up with a unique method his army did called Sherman's neckties. 
They would take the rails out, put them over ties, and light the ties on fire, superheat the middle, and then bend them. You can't use them again. Well, I mean, you could use them, but the trains turn really fast, and they don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how they destroyed it, so they couldn't use those rails again. They burnt down everything. My brother, for, God, four years, was a professor at uh, Georgia Southern in Statesboro. And this is a late, went there 1999 till 2003, I think. Years are blending together. And he was told, because he's a Yankee, he's from Montana, which is so weird, but he was told, you don't mention Sherman. We hate Sherman. And that was 2001, 2002. So I immediately, I, I said, well, you better put away that statue of Sherman you have. I really was, I tried to find something I could send to him. But then I thought, those people are kind of crazy. For example, all the courthouses and city halls in those towns that were burnt down in Sherman's March, their front doors face very defiantly south today. And this March to the Sea. And on Christmas Day, 19, 1865. So 100 years it took up to March. Christmas Day, 1864. Sherman arrived at Savannah. I know you wanted a cartoon version of the destruction of Atlanta. So here are, uh, he arrived in Savannah, I'm sorry. Cutting this swath, hundreds of thousands of slaves ran away to freedom to the Union lines. The Union, the union line represented freedom. And this is the Chester the Crab cartoon. I showed you this with the Whiskey Rebellion. Here's the crab explaining this. Here's Santa. By the way, Santa was only a couple years old by then. But he sent a message north, Sherman did. I've taken Savannah as your Christmas present. And so with that Christmas, Santa, or Santa Claus, as we know it, was only a couple years old by this time. Yeah. If he was only like very young, how can you try to slay? Huh? Santa Claus was a That's a valid point. But they didn't really have licenses then, so they you know, just a free for all up they there in the rain. But like, you would have to have a lot of precision to get Okay, that would be on the test. I want you to better write down how Santa did this. Right here with you. Maybe he had accelerated growth. He grew a beard at 2. Yeah. 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 He grew a beard at 2. So with that, <laughs> so here it's from Harper's Magazine showing the Christmas celebration. By the way, they're all already training the next generation of soldiers, just in case. <laughs> and then Sherman turned south into, or turned north into South Carolina. So you do get down, he got into South Carolina. That's actually where he made his comment, I'm going to make them scream. If they thought Georgia was destroyed, guess what he did in South Carolina? And why did they take such pleasure in destroying South Carolina? Yeah, that's where it began. So they cut a swath through here. The last fighting would be here, but he's, he's going up to beat me. And the Confederate line on Petersburg is just holding out. But every night, hundreds of men are deserting. They're reduced to almost no food. In fact, they're eating one of their main diets of bread made out of, and I'm not making this up, ground up corn cobs and sawdust. Mm, still up your stomach. Let's not talk about what sawdust does to your intestines. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, keto, very good. <laughs> yeah, lots of fiber. It'll clean you out, okay. <laughs> and actually, the, it, was, it was at this time that the Confederates said, hey, we'll emancipate our slaves. Britain, help us. Which is absolutely ridiculous because the whole reason to fight were for slavery, that shows you how it's all, I mean, it's just over. And at the end happened shockingly fast. Oh, almost forgot one thing. Sheridan, General Sheridan, remember he was the general who charged that missionary ridge and jumped out of cannon. I told that story the other day. He was given responsibility to destroy the Shenandoah Valley. And he took the tactics of total war and did it there. In fact, the story was you couldn't even see a crow fly after Sheridan got gunned. Why? So they couldn't use it anymore because it was good for farm. Couldn't use it. And at one battle called Winchester, he rode his horse and saved, kind of rallied the forces and beat right here, beat the Confederates back. And there's Sheridan. And Sheridan was made commander of the cavalry. And normally they don't want five foot four guys as cavalry. The reason, there is a logical reason. 
They want long legs to hold on to the horse. That's it, they have to strap down or something happens to him. So not only did he become the head of cavalry, he got the biggest horse he could find, Winchester, it would be known as after the battle. And you know how to measure horses by hands? This horse was over 4,000 hands high. <laughs> That'd be like 30 stories. He was he was 20 some hands, which is just a massive horse. That's so petty. Was it sideways? Like, he was like, I'm short, so I'm going to get a big horse just to rub it your guy's face. Even though Napoleon was not short, but they call it Napoleonic cons. Yeah. That's funny. But people do, you know. Wait, so Out, outside, people can be petty. Did yeah. All right, cool. I'm <laughs> Maybe, maybe and he would eventually command like the whole entire U.S. Army in the West. That's why like Sheridan, Wyoming, and Sheridan, Montana are named after him. If you go to the Smithsonian Museum of American History, the horse is still there. You can see him a carrot. <laughs> okay, you can jam a carrot at the stuffed horse's mouth. But yeah, the horse is there. <laughs> so I told some stories. Let's go and finish up the war. So war happens shockingly. Oh, gosh, I forgot Arlington. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> this mass is holding this whole thing together. Okay. So many Americans, so many U.S. soldiers had died in the fighting that the cemeteries were literally full. By the way, and I mentioned this before, that's where bombing came from, the Civil War, so they could get bodies home. It was invented during the war. Okay, but also interesting. <laughs> General, the, the adjutant general of the U.S. forces, General May, so the guy who's responsible for cemeteries, his son died at Petersburg. He was in the army. He blamed one man, and he took that one man's plantation at Arlington and, and turned that into the U.S. National Cemetery, <laughs> our most hallowed ground. Who was that man? Arlington. Wow. That's his home, Robert E. Lee. So Robert E. Lee's plantation would be taken from him. Because he's a traitor, he's gone, he's a rebel, he rebelled against the country. And that's now U.S., the, uh, it's the U.S.'s most hollow ground. It's like the whole human society. Yeah. And deserved. actually, I think it's very fitting. I, I think that's... That's deserved. Yeah, that's and if you go there, his plantation, his home is still there. The slave quarters are still behind. Uh, but I, I, um, these, are the, these are the Civil War style. They changed into more of marble. Uh, they still bury people there. It's just about full. Just about full. Yeah. Did they also bury the Confederate soldiers? No, the traitors. The only ones they buried, there was a few people in the Confederate Army after they got a general amnesty in 1872. Uh, a few fought in the, um, fought in the American West and uh, Spanish American War. But not if there was a Confederate soldier. There's also a grave there of. Uh, just a tomb of almost 12,000 bodies. They couldn't identify them because they were just destroyed in the fight. And you've heard of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. That was the way the French came, which I think is a brilliant idea, but the French came up to, to have some kind of a memorial for the hundreds of thousands of soldiers they couldn't identify, destroyed by combat. And they wanted a memorial that the Arc of Triumph, and then all the Allies caught, or everyone caught. And so that's it's amazing how everyone comes up. Yes. I think I saw when I went to church in the past, like in the Westminster Hall, I think, I don't know if that's the best one. But they have a bunch of people buried in the ground, and they get the only one you can't walk on is the under the floor. Yeah. And that's that's their tomb, and that's near the, the center. I, can't, I mispronounced it, but that, yeah, that's right there, too. And the French one's the Ark of Triumph. Here's the Ark. Here it's in um, the United States is Arlington, Germany they have, they will put one. Actually, Germany has a tomb for in almost every place. Germany kind of uh, there's a myth about World War One soldiers. World War Two is kind of an issue, so they focus on World War One. So let's finish the war. I know I started telling some stories, but the Confederates collapsed really fast, really fast. The night of. The second or third of April, the starving men just couldn't hold out any longer. Here are Confederates that, that surrendered. They couldn't run away fast enough. Here is a young Confederate soldier. This is the date. This is on the third. This picture was taken. 
Boy, does he look young. But weather beaten, I mean, they're starving. And they, he died in the line. Richmond had to be evacuated too. And when the Confederates were leaving, they tried to burn down rest, burn records and confidential material and burnt down the whole town. Including an ammo dump and see all the cannonballs that exploded out in the middle of the street. Lincoln, knowing the war was over, could not wait with just 12 troopers, which are cavalrymen. Lincoln rode into Richmond right after it fell. And he was greeted by thousands of now freedmen, former slaves, singing and praising him. And this, uh, this he um, just really got him. This is what it was about. And this is what the war was about. Unfortunately, I think you know just a week later what's going to happen to him. It's a tough life. But he met him there, and it's a great ironic twist. The cavalry men were, were one of those, they called them colored regiments. I think that's very fitting. Lee ran away, but eventually was cut off right here by cavalry under George Custer at Appomattox Courthouse. And there he surrendered on the 9th of April, 1865. One of the great stories about this, Wilma McLean, his home right there, surrendered right in his front parlor. McLean lived at a little place called Manassas Junction, obviously. And that's where the Battle of Bull Run was fought. And a cannonball exploded at his um, back pantry near his kitchen. He thought, this is a dangerous place. I got to go to someplace safe. So he moved to Appomattox Courthouse. So the war began in his front, or war began in his backyard and ended in his front parlor. So, reconstruction as much as possible tomorrow. Have a great day, right when you find work. And hang by your thumbs. Or another one I, I, I gotta start saying more often, keep punching waterfalls. Okay. That one I really like. Have a good day, everybody!